Come on, is anybody thankful for Jesus in the building? Yeah. So good to be with y'all. Hey, high five your neighbor as you're taking a seat. Welcome them to church again. Y'all look amazing today. How we feeling today? Feeling good? Jeff Cook, you feeling good, man? Feeling good? Jordan Frost, you feeling good today, man? Come on, Verb, how we feeling? I'm showing love to the second row. I need to, I need to, I need to. Brett Elliott, how you feeling today? You good? So good to see you guys today. Hey, if we're meeting for the very first time, my name is Pastor Mike O'Connell and uh, serve as associate lead pastor. And it's cool, we just launched another campus, Love Church North Omaha, come on. And uh, yes, Pastor Todd is bringing the word at Love Church North Omaha, um, but his wife Denise is with us today. And anytime I'm in the pulpit, I just wanna honor our leaders. So come on, can we put our hands together and honor our leaders? Uh, some of you might ask, man, why do you do that every single time? Because here's what I know is God calls us to honor. And as a house, we're going to say this, we honor up, we honor down, we honor all the way around. It's just part of the culture that we want to create here. And um, I'm so thankful to lean in today. We're going to be in John chapter eight. And I do just, um, I'm rocking this black shirt and the second button keeps coming undone. So <laughs> if it comes undone in the middle of the sermon, I promise you, I'm not, I'm not trying to show you any chest hair or anything. Please. And um, yeah, you're like, I'm never coming back to Love Church anymore. <laughs> hey, I'm just saying, don't be the person, right? Get, come on now. Y'all been to the restaurant and you've gotten the, you know, the green salad in your teeth and your, and your spouse or your good friend didn't tell you? You come home to brush your teeth four hours later, you're like, come on. Well, don't do that to me today. I got to keep, now I'm insecure. <laughs> got to focus. But I do, um, uh, you know, here, here's the beautiful thing. I love, uh, I love God's word and I love the mission that he's called us to. And before I even get into the sermon, I think that this is just a reminder, man, of just the goodness of God and how, you know, I just shared in a moment, uh, just how God in every single season, he's doing something. Somebody say he's doing something. And we don't always know what that is, but a couple years ago, I remember um, God challenged us to turn our first home that we, that we bought into a rental property, but he didn't tell us the next location we were moving to. And, um, and I'm thankful for my mother-in-law who's sitting in the front, front row, Lisa, who let us uh, stay in her home for a little season. And I just remember thinking, okay, Lord, I don't know what the next step is. This is definitely a step of faith. And I'm trying to lead my family in the direction that you're taking us. And he worked it all out ab exceedingly abundantly above all we could think, ask, or imagine in that season, but I remember in that season of uh, living at, I, I call her Mama Lisa's house, um, I met Jason, and Jason is joining us today in the front row today, and um, Jason, uh, here's the cool thing, is I sat out uh, many nights uh, connecting with Jason, just chatting about life, and uh, he found out what I did, and I told him about our church, and I'm pretty sure he's sitting in here today, and he would tell you he hasn't missed an online encounter since I lived there in 2021. Now, when I first met him, I'm pretty sure he said, I don't, I'll watch online, but I don't know that I'll ever come in person. And I just kept, I just kept probing like one day, man, one day you're going to show up. I just believe it. And it's funny because yesterday he reached out and said, are you preaching? Now, I didn't know he would show up today, but man. Uh, just so cool that you're in the room today and just, yeah, so beautiful. Just, man, just, just believing that God's going to speak to you today. That's what I'm believing. So um, anyways, John, the book of John, anybody liking the book of John? I mean, come on. The book of John is amazing. And uh, there's 21 chapters in the book of John. And this is one of my favorite, um, this is one of my favorite books in the Bible. And specifically, man, when you're new in Christ, this is a great Great place to start, but I do think it is important every single time we're getting into the word. We're a simple church that goes straight through the word of God. We're in the gospels in the book of Acts this year, and uh, we've just launched into the book of John, and our writer is John. John, we know this about John. He, he, he said he was Jesus' favorite. You know what I mean? Like, so good. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Jesus' beloved. Like, Jesus loves me the most, but I think this is a, 
this is a really good book, and I, I wanna just lay this out for you because I believe that John is divided into five parts. And if you're new to the Bible, this is really how the book of John goes. In John 1, uh, it introduces Jesus. Chapters 12, uh, 2 through 12 detail seven miraculous signs. Chapters 13 through 17 focus on the night before Jesus' trial. A fun fact here, this, this gospel spends the most time on Jesus' night before his trial. I think that's kind of interesting. Chapters 18 through 20 uh, cover his arrest, trial, crucifixion, and resurrection. And then chapter 21 concludes with the disciples' ongoing mission. And for those of you that are new to the Bible, we know this, that the, the gospels mean good news. These are the accounts of the life of Jesus. And this is, come on, everybody remembers the what would Jesus do bracelets. And I just believe that we're living through a time period more than ever that we need to study the life of Jesus and not just study it, but start applying it. Yeah, come on. That this book, if we'll, if we'll come to this book with humility and the Holy Spirit, I promise you, we will leave this book different. Is anybody with me? You can read this book, but this book will read you. This, this book right here will confront you. And I believe that even in church today, yes, God wants to encourage us. God wants to comfort us today. But God, God wants to convict us because what good is it if we come in here Sunday after Sunday and we look the same leaving? I don't know about you, but I want to come before God today and say, God, I'm coming to your word today. I'm humbling myself. Would you teach me? Is anybody else with me today? All right, let's go straight to the word of God. John chapter eight, verses one through 11. I'm going to read the scripture for us today. This story preaches for itself, doesn't it? It says this in the word of God, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Interesting, the man wasn't joining her, huh? Verse 4, teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Here it is. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say, Jesus? What do you have to say about this, Jesus? Oh, we got him. We got him right where we want him. Verse six, they were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. Here it is, verse nine, when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Verse 10, then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? Verse 11, no, Lord, she said. And Jesus said this, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. If you're taking notes today, you can write down the title of today's message. Uh, the title is this, Drop Your Stones. Drop Your Stones. Father, we come to your word and we pray for, for divine understanding and wisdom today. We pray for conviction and transformation as this word is preached. I yield my tongue to you to say what you wanna say to your people. God, I love this church, but you love this church way more than me. God, would you build it today? Would you equip it today? Would you do a, a work in this place? We declare that today is a day of salvation for some in the room today, and would you receive the glory? In Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. So earlier this summer, it might have been spring, um, we were in the backyard hanging with some friends, and my son Judah uh, comes out and says, Dad, I need to talk to you, and I'm like, oh boy. Oh, Judah. If Judah says I need to talk to you, it's serious because usually like Judah's personality is the kind of, he, he's, he's the one that likes to hide. You know what I mean? Like you, you find like, hey, uh, Judah, what happened here? Or oh, what had happened was like hours later. So when Judah's coming to, to grab me, I know, I know that, you know, something's going on. And he, he proceeded to tell me that he was in the basement playing this axe throwing game that we have. Now, before you think of like real axes in our basement, they're plastic, just plastic axes. And um, the cool thing is this game is so fun. There's like a bullseye 
uh, that you throw these axes into, and, and I actually get into it. Like, there's been some, we've had some competitive battles in our basement. Anybody else know what game I'm kind of talking about here? It's, yeah, it's super fun. And Judah was, was playing with a friend, and Judah comes out, and he's like, hey, Dad, I, I got some bad news. Like, we, we were playing the axe game, and we just, like, my friend totally missed the bullseye target, and, and it cracked the TV in the basement. I'm thinking to myself, oh, my goodness. Oh, I'm like, that's just, it's all good. That's just stuff. We can replace that. I'm just glad you guys are okay. It's going to be all good. And, um, and I'm thinking to myself, I go down to just kind of scope it out a little bit later. And I'm like, man, they, they like missed the bullseye. Like, what were they doing? Are you sure y'all were aiming for that thing? My goodness. Like you were way off, like way, way off. And um, it's interesting because when I think about the definition sin in the Bible, it really means missing the mark. That's all sin is. Sin is missing the mark. And I think of what it says in Romans, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's interesting, man. Don't walk around puffed up like you've never sinned in your life. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's why I love what Pastor Cap said during the marriage prayer. Like, why are we coming into church trying to act like we have it all together when beneath the surface we're struggling and we're in here and God wants freedom and power and liberty and the abundant life for us, but we're, we would rather put on a front and a mask and deny what's going on on the inside. The reality is, is we've all, we've all missed the mark, right? We've all fallen short in thought, word, and deed. And as we look at this passage of scripture today, it's so easy to get caught up in the woman who's caught, caught in adultery and miss out on the self-righteous sin of the Pharisees. That's why I love this text, because no matter where you're at in your faith journey, you can find yourself somewhere in this story to some degree. And we're going to lean into that here in just a second on really asking ourselves this question, like, where, where do I, where am I at today? Who, who, who in this particular season can I identify in this story? And really, you're going to see the woman, which uh, the woman represents those of us that have fallen into the trap of worshiping pleasure, okay? Then you're gonna see the critics. The critics are the Pharisees, and those are those of us in the room that have fallen into the trap of worshiping power. And then there's the Christ. And the Christ, he, he came uh, to reveal that there is freedom when you and I worship the Savior. That's really what we're gonna look at today. And so, number one, I want you to write this down, the critics, the critics, the trap of worshiping power. I'm going to give you a sticky statement to write down. You can think about this. I may not come back to this, but I want to give it to you. This quote says this, judgment fuels our ego, but grace transforms it. Judgment fuels our ego, but grace transforms it. In verse four of our passage, the Pharisees say, teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her, what do you say? What I want us to understand in this particular text is this was a power play by the Pharisees because they were threatened by the popularity of Jesus's ministry in this moment. See, they had the power. The Pharisees had the power. They were the ones that the Jews looked to, but Jesus rolls up on the set and begins to start sharing a new message, a message of grace a message of transformation. He's doing all these miracles like we discussed, and here they are going, who does this guy think he is? Who does he think he is? And so they're trying to trap him here. In verse six, it says they were trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again, and I love this. He said this, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. So we, gotta, we, ha we have to catch what's going on here because, again, I just said it. The Pharisees viewed Jesus' popularity with alarm. They feared. Here's what they feared. They feared losing their influence with the people, and they feared retaliation by the Romans if Jesus' followers started a revolt. So they set a trap for Jesus. Now, here's what we need to know. If Jesus says, let her go, then he would be breaking the law of Moses. But if he says, execute her for the crime of adultery, then Jesus would seem harsh and perhaps cruel against the message that he was spreading. And also, 
he would break Roman law because the Romans had taken the right of official execution for religious offenses away from the Jews. Are you catching this? What's so interesting, though, is that we look at these these Pharisees and in the midst of them trying to set a trap for Jesus, they're actually setting a trap for themselves. I was reminded a few years ago, my guy, Royce, uh, Royce, uh, you know, he was I was I was finding uh, something really interesting happening in our house. He would he would I would put him to bed and then I would hear some rustling around in the in the kitchen. And one night I went to the kitchen and I noticed that the pantry door was shut. Now, listen, the pantry door is never shut in the O'Connell household. So I knew somebody was in there. So I go knocking on the door. Hey, is anybody in there? And he yells in his deep voice, no. (laughs) Somebody say exposed. (laughs) I don't know if that's a confession or what, but. So I open the door and there he is and and his cute little face, he's sitting down and the chip bag is open, the cookie bag is open and the chocolate chip bag is open. And my man's got chocolate, chocolate, like all over his face. And I'm like, what are you doing? He looks nothing. (laughs) Brother, the the chocolate is on your face. It's it's so interesting because when I, when I, when I think about these critics, it's like, and this is what happens when we worship power is, is oftentimes what happens when we're worshiping power and position is in the midst of worshiping power and position, we, we lose purity. Meaning, they were so focused on calling out the sin of the woman that they missed the own sin in their own life. Because what, we, because what Jesus is exposing here is their motivation. Do, do you realize this, y'all, that when we read this text, that it was very, like it was incredibly rare to catch people in the act of adultery. The only way that you could uh, judge this crime is if you actually caught them in the act. Like you saw it and it had to be two witnesses that saw it. So this was incredibly rare. So scholars submit that this was actually probably a setup. I started thinking, man, I wonder, I wonder if it was a setup. As a matter of fact, I wonder if the reason that the man isn't there standing there getting ready to get stoned is because maybe he was one of the Pharisees. Now, we don't know this. I'm making speculation here, but think about this. This is is what worshiping power and position will do, and we see it in the global church, that that people get raised up. They, They have a platform. They have position, and next thing you know, you hear about their moral failure. And I'm not here to to, to call them out or throw a stone at them. But the reality is this, is God wants to keep us in a posture of humility before him. The Bible says that those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. And I just know that there are some of us in the church today that we can identify with the crusty religious spirit of the Pharisees, that we come in with our arms crossed. And, you know, if you think about your, the sin that you struggle with, All you have to think about is who you were talking about all last week. Hello, somebody. Like in the church, right? It's it's easy to to call out the person that, that committed adultery or the person struggling with addiction or the things that show up on the outside. But what about the private sins? What, what about the pride in our hearts? What about the gossip in our conversations that nobody really hears? See, what we need to understand is that certainly in this text, Jesus sets this woman free, and we're going to talk about it here in a second, but Jesus didn't come to just set the woman caught in adultery free. He came to set the Pharisees free, the self-righteous free. And sometimes I believe that we can be so close yet so far away in our hearts. Is anybody with me today? And I believe that in this place today, God would want us to come in here And just like David prayed in Psalm chapter 51, search my heart, O God, and reveal anything that is off in me. Here's what I know is that oftentimes if you struggle with judgment, you struggle with passive aggressiveness. That's a good indicator. And I was thinking about it because that's my struggle at times. There are certain things that come out of my mouth and I think to myself as I'm driving by myself, that was pretty passive aggressive. What is that connected to? 
it's ultimately connected to judgment. You know, I'm passive aggressive when I compare myself to somebody else and maybe I don't like what I'm receiving or like what's happening in this relationship or whatever the case is, and so then I'm passive aggressive. This is pride. This is ego. This is self-righteousness. And here's what I know is that Jesus wants to put self-righteousness to death today so that we can walk in newness of life and freedom. Is anybody with me in here today? This is what we see, uh, the critics. We, we see them masquerading their pride and making it look like they're doing their spiritual duty as leaders, but all along, the motivations of their heart is off. It's what I said earlier, when you worship power, you lose purity. In a subtle way, we often justify judging others to elevate ourselves just like the Pharisees. Now, this is not the only thing that we see in this section of scripture, um, but here's, I want, I, I want to come back to this because I think this, this is really powerful. Um, Nathan shared this with me, so I got to give him credit uh, for this, for what I'm about to share with you right now. Nathan was who was leading us on the keys. Come on, can we just give God some praise right now for that? But he and I were going back and forth about just what God wanted to do today, and he shared this with me, and I thought it was really profound and just something that I wanted to share in regards to this section of scripture. But he said this, if you see in John 7, 37 and 38, the night before this moment, Jesus said this, that whoever believes in him shall have living water. Okay, so have living water. In John 8, 6 through 8, it's describing the moment when he bent into the ground and began writing. There are only ever two moments in the Bible where this action takes place, here and in Jeremiah. When people read this passage, we're always uh, asking the question, what was Jesus writing in the dirt? Now, I can't tell you because I don't know, but I think that this is really profound. In Jeremiah 17, 13, listen to what it says. It says, O Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Here it is. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust. Because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. Whoo! <laughs> That's a revelation, folks. So there's many scholars that do speculate that Jesus was writing down their names in the dust because they had forsaken the living water. But that's not the only, folks, that Jesus, that's not the only thing that Jesus is trying to address in here, although he does, but he's also trying to address the condemned. And this is where we get to point two, the condemned, the trap of worshiping pleasure. I'm gonna give you a sticky statement to write down in your notes. But what brings you pleasure today may bring you chains tomorrow. I just believe that if we look around, I mean, I think I heard that we see over like 500 ads a day. Maybe it's 5,000. I don't know. It's some crazy amount. But the culture is just vying for our discontentment. It's like they want us to be in a posture of being discontent. Is anybody with me today? Like, you don't have enough. You don't make enough. Your house isn't big enough. You don't drive a nice enough car. Like, you can find somebody that's better looking. Like, you could never have enough sexual relationships or whatever the case is, this is what the world is throwing right in front of us. And in John 8, 3 and 4, it says, as he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery and they put her in front of the crowd. Now, I want to address this because I think it's interesting. We see that Jesus ultimately uh, tells the woman, neither do I condemn you, now go and sin no more. And we'll get to that here in a second. But there are some of you in here today that maybe you can identify um, with the woman that's caught in adultery, and maybe it's not because you've been caught in adultery, but maybe it's because you've been worshiping pleasure. Because what causes someone, a man or a woman, to commit adultery? We commit adultery because we aren't content with what we already have. And here, here's what I want to just even speak over marriages. We came in here today and we were praying over marriages. And I believe that this is a word for marriages in here today. But there are married people in the room today that you've exalted happiness in your marriage and you've downplayed holiness. Can I tell you today that Jesus doesn't just use marriage for your happiness, but also your holiness? 
I believe that this is just something for us to lean into today. And most people that go outside of their marriage, they do it because they're chasing something new. And new is often easier than changing for the one that you're already with. Can I tell you today that God is not in the business of giving you what your flesh wants, which is comfort. God is committed to helping you become the son and daughter that he predestined for you to become, but it can't happen without your participation. So I want to tell somebody today, get back in your home, get rid of your burner phone, cancel the business trips because God can do a miracle in your marriage if you will let him. Come on, will you receive it in here today? He'll do it. The enemy always over promises and under delivers. Is anybody with me in here today? He will plant thoughts in your mind like the grass will be greener over there with her or with him. No, the grass will be green where you and I water it. It's just the, 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 the devil, the devil is, is, is playing. He's overplaying his hand. And this poor, this poor woman falls for it. And I don't have any backstory. I don't know what was going on uh, in that situation or with the man or the woman. I don't, I don't understand all those details, but a woman who's caught in adultery is brought to the forefront and it, it would, we would be remiss if we just didn't pause and talk about this idea of how so often we fall, our, we fall into the trap of being discontent and we begin chasing pleasure. It just kind of keeps us on this rat wheel. It's like I, I picture, um, I love my, my little girl, Journey. Journey, Journey Lael. She's so adventurous, and, and the Chatfields know this as well, but like if there's frogs on the loose in our neighborhood, Journey's gonna trap them. If there's grasshoppers jumping around in the wood chips, she's gonna catch them. Like she will... She will see a bunny and she will believe that she can catch the bunny. (laughs) And uh, I think this is how pleasure works in life. It's like chasing the grasshopper. It's like chasing the frog. It's like chasing the bunny. It just kind of keeps you going crazy. And I'll tell you this much. There's been times where she's chasing frogs, like destroying our plants. And and it's like, this is what pleasure will do. It'll have you just chasing everything and, and, and you, you're never really content and yet you're destroying all of what God already put in your life. This is what pleasure does. And the beautiful thing is in Ecclesiastes chapter two, Solomon, who uh, is, is, is called the wisest man to ever live on earth besides Jesus, I always like to say, um, because listen, Jesus is the creator. Solomon was the created So we'll just go ahead and say, Jesus is a little bit more wise than Solomon. Is anybody with me today? But in Ecclesiastes chapter two, I love this. I wanna just read this word word over you and I want you to receive this today. Uh, If you can identify with this idea of running after pleasure, whether that's another relationship or whether that's more money or whether that's stuff. Some of you in here today, I wanna declare this over somebody today that you're gonna become debt free as a result of today being released from chasing pleasure. You don't need another Amazon Prime order to be content. And all the husbands are like, amen, brother. (laughs) Amen. He finally said it. Ah. Oh, I I can come after you too. You just just relax. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter two, listen to this. I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found that this too was meaningless. So I said, laughter is silly. What good does it do to seek pleasure? After much thought, I decided to cheer myself with wine. And while still seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. In this way, I tried to experience the only happiness most people find during their brief life in this world. I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and by planting beautiful vineyards. I made gardens and parks, filling them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to collect the water to irrigate my many flourishing groves. I bought slaves, both men and women, and others were born into my household. I also owned large herds and flocks more than any other kings who, that had lived in Jerusalem before me. I collected great sums of silver and gold, the treasure of many kings and provinces. I hi- hired wonderful singers, both men and women, and had many beautiful concubines. Listen, this guy had like 300 wives and like 600 concubines. I had everything a man could desire. 
So I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. And this is where some of you are at today. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. Here it is. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. This is, this is what it looks like when we fall into the trap of worshiping pleasure. There comes a point where I believe by the grace of God and the spirit of God, he awakens you to the reality that the thing you have been chasing will never fulfill or satisfy. And eventually when you come to the end of that road, I believe that you are primed and you are ready to receive the grace of God and walk in newness of life. Is anybody with me today? Has anybody experienced that in here today? Can anybody be honest in the room today and say, God, would you do something to release me from worshiping pleasure? Which leads us to point three, the Christ, the freedom of worshiping the Savior. Here's what I want to tell us today, that freedom isn't found in carrying stones, but in laying them down. In this particular text, the the, the imagery here is that these Pharisees are holding stones, but how many of you know that, that I think of stones, stones are like weight. We don't see the woman carrying a stone, but let me just tell you that when you're, when you're seeking pleasure, when you're, when, you're, when you're enslaved and entrapped in a lifestyle of sin, it's like having a backpack on and throwing stones in your backpack. It just weighs you down. Is anybody with me in here today? So whether you identify with the Pharisee or the woman caught in adultery, today I'm declaring that God is asking us to lay our stones down. Yeah, come on. That he wants, to, he wants us to walk out of here free because 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. I, I love how Jesus ends this section of scripture. He, he asks the woman, woman, where are they? Has, has no one condemned you? She says, no one. Then neither do I condemn you. And I love this version in the NIV. Jesus declares this, now go and leave your life of sin. What we need to understand here is that when we have this encounter with Jesus, when we come face to face with Jesus, that Jesus would never call you and I to something that he wouldn't give us the power to walk out. I need somebody to catch that again in here today. That he looks at this woman and says, neither do I condemn you. Forgiveness. He didn't condemn her because he was going to condemn himself so that she could walk in newness of life. Neither do I condemn you. Forgiveness. Now go and sin no more. Power, freedom is what Jesus grants you and I. See, this is, this is the perfect picture of how Jesus deals with our sin. Because here's what I want us to know in here today. Whether you can identify with the person that is self-righteous or you identify with the, with the woman who you can imagine what she must have felt. She must have felt shame. She must have felt guilt. And I talk to a lot of people in our culture. And as a result, here's what's interesting is we're like working against the mission of Jesus because what happens is only by the grace of God, we as believers encounter the truth of God and we begin walking the truth of God out. And then we begin trying to hold people accountable that haven't surrendered or encountered the grace of God. Now we know this, that the truth of God needs to be proclaimed boldly in culture today and we need to stand for truth. But we are to speak the truth in what? In love. Equally on the other side, Jesus isn't just saying, you know what woman? Just go, you're released. And some of us in the church today that we've used grace as a license to keep on sinning. But Jesus didn't set you free so that you could walk forward in chains. We're declaring today that you would be set free and you would begin moving in a new direction today. This is what Jesus is doing in our church and I'm so encouraged by it. I was in, a, in my small group this week and this is where we're gonna 
land for today. I was in my small group this week and um, we were going around and just testifying of the grace of God. There's a young man in our group that began, that's you know, been in our group for just over a year now. And he was sharing how he had never encountered the presence of God until he showed up to our group for the very first time. Now, if I'm really candid and honest, I don't even remember the first time he showed up. But he went on to share that on that particular day when he showed up, he described to the group that he was walking through the storm of his life. Now, he didn't open up any further and we didn't press, but he said he was walking through a storm, Kevin. So what did we do as a group? We surrounded him and we prayed for him and it was on that day that he encountered the presence of God for the very first time. Now, later in what he was describing in this particular meeting is that the storm that he was walking through was that he had a struggle with his sexual identity for over 18 years and had struggled with homosexuality. When he walked into our group on that particular day, he was in a 10-year relationship with a man. Now, I don't know where you find yourself in this place today, but here's what I know is that that man was, he encountered the presence of God and the love of God through God's people. And as a result, kept showing up. And guess what? That man was baptized. That man was baptized in the spirit. That man ended the relationship. And now he's moving in a new direction, walking out in obedience to what the word of God says. It's interesting because I, I reached out anytime I'm going to share something like this. I always want to want to get permission from from the person's story that I'm sharing. Even though I didn't use the name, I just would never want to divulge that information without, without their blessing. And uh, I, I love this text message. He said this, you are welcome to share it all. Honestly, I just thought being a good person and believing God was good enough, but God has showed me he wants so much more than that. He took away my stress, depression, porn habits, and marijuana habits. I just need him. But I've always been a fighter, going through a double lung transplant in 2010, having cystic fibrosis, diabetes, and heart issues. I take 45 pills a day and I see about six doctors. I know God has a big purpose and hopefully this inspires a lot of people. Here's what's powerful about his story is, uh, and this just moves my heart. That's what I want. I, I, want, I, want, I want the people in this room to understand this today, that this is a church that will meet you where you at, are at. We serve a God that will meet you where you are at. But I promise you, if you encounter grace, if you encounter the living God, he's not looking for perfection in your life, but he's looking for a new direction for your life, that he loves you too much to keep you the same. He went on to share with our group this past Thursday that he shared his story publicly and he's been having multiple men that have the same struggle reaching out to him and he's been taking them to dinner and sharing his transformation story. Oh, come on, somebody. And here's, here's the point and the principle that I want us to catch today is that your struggle isn't my struggle and your struggle isn't her struggle. And your struggle isn't his struggle. And your struggle isn't your struggle. But here's what I know. Is that when God, when you allow God into your struggle, when you allow him to set you free, when you begin saying, you know what, God, I, 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 wanna, I wanna obey you with my whole life, guess what? That becomes your ministry. What used, to, what used to chain you, Jesus freed you. And now guess what? You get to go give the prescription away. Come on, is anybody with me today? So Father, we thank you for this picture this morning that you came and you came to set the captives free, that you came to give us power to walk in obedience to your word. God, we thank you for this story, for this powerful picture. And Father, for today, whatever stones we're carrying, I pray that we would drop it in the name of Jesus, that we would experience freedom this morning. Let's stand to our feet if we would, church. Here's what the Bible says. It says that we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. If you really see uh, anything in this passage of scripture, what you see is the gospel message. 
that Jesus, he left heaven, came to earth, lived the perfect life that you and I couldn't. He was the only one who was without sin that could actually cast the stone. But instead of casting the stone, he pinned himself to a tree because he loved you and I. It wasn't the nails that kept him there, it was his love for you and me. He longs for relationship with humanity. But you know what it requires? Here's what the Bible says. It says that godly sorrow leads men to repentance. Here's what I've learned, that when you and I recognize that our sin separates us from, from God, now it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance because you go, oh my goodness, God laid down his life so that I could be restored back into right relationship with him? My goodness, how could I not freely receive that gift? Is anybody with me today? And so that gift is available in the room today. We're not gonna sing because of time, but just with every, ha with every head bowed right now, I just wanna pray for you. And if today you're in the room and you know that you need to make peace with God, I want you to just slip your hand in the air and I'm gonna pray with you right where you're at. Just slip your hand in the air today if you need to make peace with God, I see, a hand, I see two hands over here, I love it. I see hands in the balcony. Just keep your hands nice and lifted up. This is your, the Bible says this, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father. This is Jesus speaking. And today, in this moment of sin, surrender, I just want you to pray this prayer. Say, Lord God, this is for you, join us online. Lord God, I invite you inside to be my God, to be my Savior, and to be my friend. Forgive me of my sin. For I'm deciding today to follow you, Jesus. With the same spirit that lifted you out of that grave, fill me afresh and anew today so that I can move forward loving you and loving people all the days of my life. Come on, let's put our hands together for those saying yes to Jesus today. Hey, here, here's the challenge I wanna give you before I invite Jordan up. Just stay with us for just a second. Typically, I would invite you forward, but because of time, I'm not. But here's what I want you to know. If you just prayed that prayer, we've got a team right over here by the doors that would just love to give you a Bible. Here's what I would tell you. Before you leave today, just stop over this way. As soon as we end the encounter, we wanna give you a Bible and pray with you and send you on your way. Can you do that today? Hey, church, somebody say, drop the stone. Drop the stone. Let's go be salt and light this week. Come on, give it up for Jordan, y'all.